Amen. Take your Bible and turn to my favorite book of the Bible, the book of John, the Gospel of John. I say that because it might change before tonight's over. And John chapter number one. You know, we're talking about our sermon title tonight is the right tension, the right tension. I believe that a church that is full of Jesus and Christians who are full of Jesus will be balanced. They'll maintain the right kind of tension in their lives. Now, let me explain this for just a moment. There are certain kinds of churches that specialize in making people feel condemned. They always tell you what they're against, but you'll never find out what they are for. They don't like to step on toes. They like to stomp on feet. And uh, uh, there are many churches like that. Uh, there are fewer than there used to be, but there are still many of them. There are other churches. They try to make you feel comfortable no matter what. They never talk about sin or the consequences of sin. They believe the 11th commandment is, thou shalt not offend anybody. Their number one goal is to make sure that everybody feels good all the time. They rarely, if ever, talk about sin or the consequences of sin. And if they do it, they do it qu quickly and casually and move on. Now, I believe there's something wrong with a church that wants to offend everybody. I do. Now, some of us, we like that old hard preaching, and we like it. But there's something wrong with a church that wants to offend everybody. And there's something wrong with a church that's afraid to offend anybody. Anybody. Jesus didn't offend everybody, but he, he offended some people for sure because he was balanced. Now, what was he balanced between? We'll talk about that. But this gospel, the gospel of John, was written by the apostle, the disciple John. He's actually in the inner circle of Jesus Jesus had 12 disciples, and he loved all of them, but he also had this inner circle, this small group of men, Peter, James, and John, that were even closer to him. They really got up close and personal with Jesus, and John tells us something about Jesus that is a key that unlocks the secret of why Jesus is just absolutely amazing and captivating. Look at John chapter 1, verse 14. It says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now, the first part of that verse is what we call the incarnation. The incarnation. Uh, uh, Christ came down from heaven and was born here on earth. The incarnation took on human flesh. And then he talks about, we beheld his glory. Now what he's talking about is that life from the time that he came to this earth and he lived with those disciples. But I believe he's also talking about that Mount of Transfiguration when him and that inner circle of disciples, they saw Jesus in his glory and Elijah and Moses. It was an incredible moment, right? But in his birth, Jesus came out of a womb, and in his death, Jesus came out of a tomb. This incredible man, God incarnate, right? And so what he tells us here, though, is something that, that explains why he drew men and women, boys and girls, to him. They had to meet this man, touch this man, hear this man. For many, they gave their life to this man. John says this. Look at the last part of verse 14. He says he was full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Jesus kept the right tension between the two all the time. He was perfectly balanced, full of grace and truth. Look at this next slide. When you're full of Jesus, you'll be full of grace and truth. And truth. When a church is full of Jesus, it'll be full of grace and truth. For Jesus, it came naturally. For us, it has to happen supernaturally through the Holy Spirit. Okay? On the one hand, let's be honest, we all tend to lean one way more than we do another, right? Usually, maybe dad leans a little bit more toward the truth. And maybe mama leans a little bit more to, to grace, right? When I was a little, little boy, my daddy was Mr. Truth. And mama was Mrs. Grace, okay? Matter of fact, I've learned something uh, by, uh, from some of you grandparents. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've kind of learned something. It's this. When my kids were growing up... You know, uh, I feel like we were balanced, but I was Mr. Truth, and Alicia was Mrs. Grace many times. When we have them grandbabies someday, if the Lord will let us, we switch in chairs. I'm going to be Mr. Grace, and I'm going to let Alicia be Mrs. Truth for a while and see how she likes it. Amen? I, I look forward to her saying, get them down from there. I ain't going to do it. Why not? That ain't my kid. <laughs> That's my grandbaby. Leave my grandbaby alone. Everything's fine. Listen, when it comes to us in our personal lives, 
We tend to give ourselves grace. And when it comes to other people, we tend to dish out a little bit of truth in their lives. Look at this next slide. Too often, in order to cut ourselves some slack, we tend to cut others up. And it's true. With Jesus, grace and truth were perfectly joined at the hip. They went together. He never shared grace at the expense of truth, and he never spoke truth at the expense of grace. He was balanced. And so I'm starting on Sunday nights. We're going to have this little sermon series for a few weeks. And this is what we're going to be talking about and why we as Christians want to live a balanced life because it's important and how Jesus was full of grace and full of truth at the same time, always full of grace and always full of truth. So take some notes tonight. Uh, We need to, number one, we need the love of grace. We need it, man. We need it. Not just, you know, what John said, but... I want you to listen to the order of it. He says Jesus was full of grace and truth. I think the order is significance. Now, because if you were a Jewish person and you're reading this, grace would need to come first. A first century Jew knew all he needed to know about truth, right? There are plenty of people telling the truth, but there wasn't a lot of grace. Matter of fact, as we've, you know, the last couple of weeks we've talked about the Old Testament, there really wasn't an overarching emphasis on grace in the Old Testament, was it? But there was a lot of truth, a lot of truth, the law of God. The Pharisees found 613 commandments, 613 laws, just in the first five books of the Bible that they expected everybody to follow. And so laws and truth were everywhere. Grace was a little bit harder to find. But now let me tell you, grace is all over the Old Testament as well. And that foreshadowing. Right? Do you remember when God was going to destroy the earth with water because men were so wicked and sinful? And God said, that's it. We're going to do the reboot right now. Look at Genesis 6, verse 8. It says, but Noah found, what did he find? Grace. Now, in your Bible, it might say favor or something, a different translation. Uh, that's the, this is the right translation. Grace, because it, that's the word. It's the exact same word where we get the word for grace. God, in his grace, chose not to destroy everyone or everything. There's stories that illustrate the grace of God throughout the Old Testament, right? But the overarching emphasis in the Old Testament is on truth. Truth. That's why John points out, look at John 1 verse 17. He says, for the law was given through who? Moses. Moses. But when Jesus came along, the light of grace grace shined on the law of God. That's why people who are so much unlike Jesus liked Jesus. Jesus loved hanging out around with sinners, and sinners loved hanging around with Jesus. Jesus drew the unchurched and the unbelieving the way a magnet is drawn to iron. That's, I want to be full of Jesus, because let's be honest, a lot of people, the unchurched and unbelievers, when they think of Christians, it's not always a positive sight. The reason why we don't show grace often enough uh, is a mystery. Well, because we're showing ourselves grace and we're doling out truth. Uh, When Jesus came on the scene, again, everything changed. I heard one pastor say this. Look at this next slide. He said, in Jesus, the stern face of the law was transformed into the shining face of grace. I like that. Anybody who met Jesus knew instantly that he loved them, that he cared about them, and Jesus wanted the best for them. We need grace for ourselves, and for others. Number two, write this down. But we also need the conviction of the truth. We need truth. Now let's read that verse again with a different emphasis. John 1, 14, full of grace and truth. Jesus did not have a one-sided approach with people. Matter of fact, look at this next slide. This is our national symbol. Uh, And the left talon are 13 arrows, and the right talon is an olive branch. It symbolizes the fact that, hey, we're a nation that wants peace, but we're ready for war. Balance. Balance. In a similar way, Jesus always brings two things to the table. Jesus always brings grace, but he also brings truth to the table. He gives truth. There's this caricature of Jesus in our culture today that we kind of try to make him look like us. But not just like us, but like the really, really good version of us. The really, really nice version of us. You know, the Jesus that is sugar and spice and everything nice. The Jesus that is tolerant of everything and everybody. The Jesus that says, I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Everything's going to be okay. It's the Jesus who fits in perfectly with the, uh, the belief that it's wrong to tell everyone or anyone that they have the wrong theology. Um, 
look at this next slide. This is Richard Newber. He's a, yeah, a famous Yale Divinity School professor back in the day. And he says, we've created this make-believe God. He says, a God without wrath brings men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministry of a Christ without a cross. It just ain't so. It didn't happen. It, that perfectly signifies all grace and no truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And so when we speak, we want to speak grace. When we speak, we want to speak truth. We want to give grace, but we also must give truth. Let me give you some examples. Look at this next slide. And we're going to go through several of these really quickly. Uh, grace says there's a, a way to God for anyone. Truth says there is only one way to God. Look at this next one. Grace says redemption. Why is that on my slides? Grace says redemption is possible. Truth says repentance is necessary. Grace says I love you just the way you are. Truth says I love you too much to let you stay that way. Grace says I love sinners. Truth says I hate sin. Grace says anybody can come to God. Truth says everybody must come through Jesus. Grace says God is love. Truth says God is holy. Grace says there is a heaven. Truth says there is a hell. Grace says there is salvation for everyone who desires it. Truth says there is judgment for everyone who doesn't. Grace says you are saved by grace through faith. But truth says faith without works is dead. We need love and compassion of grace, but we need the conviction of truth. Well, what we need, number three, write this down. We need both. Both. Listen again to John's concluding statement in this section in verse 17. He says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth, they were just joined together. Grace without truth is deceptive. Truth without grace is defective. Look at this next line. Grace without truth equals liberalism. Those who want grace without truth are quick to excuse and they're slow to confront. It's absolutely liberalism and ignores the truth in God's word. But look at this next line. Truth without grace equals legalism. Legalism. Those who want truth with no grace are quick to judge and slow to forgive and quick to desire their own preferences over the word of God. Grace and truth equals liberty in Christ. Look at this next slide. A bird needs two wings to fly. If you took one of those wings off that bird, that bird's not going to fly. That bird's not going anywhere. The same thing's true of the gospel. The gospel needs two wings to fly. Those two wings, grace and truth. Grace and truth. Jesus wasn't 50% grace and 50% truth. Jesus was 100% grace and 100% truth. Jesus wasn't grace on Monday and truth on Tuesday. He was grace and truth 24-7. Matter of fact, look at this slide. Jesus was all grace, man. He was all of it. He welcomed sinners and tax collectors, and, and he welcomed little children to come sit on his lap. He, he touched the untouchable. He healed lepers and the lame and blind people. He even made a convicted felon who was suffering the death penalty uh, receive his grace and loved him. Look at this next slide. But Jesus was all truth, man. He condemned the religious leaders and the hypocrites of his day, the liars and hypocrites. Jesus talked more about hell than he ever did about heaven. It's not even close, just to be honest with you. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me. He said, judgment is coming to Jerusalem, even though he loved Jerusalem. i tell you what I've learned about myself, and this is true. I'm just going to be transparent. I promise it's true about you, too. When you're full of yourself, Right? You'll usually be full of truth and empty of grace. Right? Or maybe you'll just be all grace and empty of truth. But when you're full of yourself and not full of Jesus, that's when you're completely out of balance. I must confess there's times in my ministry where I preach truth more heavily than I preach grace. I'll let you into a little insight. You know we have two services on Sunday morning. Right? It wouldn't hurt you to come to both of them. But listen to me. No, we wouldn't have room for you. Listen. Listen. <laughs> Everything that could go wrong this morning went wrong. You ever have one of those days? Anybody? Mine was worse. You know, uh, uh, Brother Glenn Ellis's funeral was after yesterday. Uh, we, we loved them and their family, so our thoughts and prayers were them. We got up this mon morning to find out that another mentor in the ministry, somebody we care about dearly, passed away about 6 o'clock this morning. 
And so we had that bad news. And then about 7 o'clock this morning, Marcus decided to throw up and ruin my Sunday. Okay? Terrible of him. So Marcus gets sick, right? And so now I'm like, oh, I need to let Andrew know. Because I don't know if you know this or not, Marcus does a lot of work around the church. He, he's embarrassing some of you. And so <laughs> he's, it's true. And so um, it, truth. <laughs> Have it. And so uh, he, he, usually Marcus gets here and he cuts the projectors on, gets the computer going, Facebook Live, all those kind of things. He'll kind of get that going for us. If Andrew's here, uh, he'll kind of take care of that and, and those kind of things. But it's usually Marcus. So Marcus is sick. So I'm like, oh, man, I better let Andrew know Marcus isn't going to be here this morning. So I text Andrew. I'm like, hey, Marcus isn't going to be here this morning. And Andrew's like, me neither. I'm in Nashville. And I'm like, oh, no. You know, who else knows how to do it? Well, they're out of town, too. And I know how to do it. But kind of, anyway, and so also it was cold. Wasn't it cold this morning? About 30 degrees this morning. Well, our, our, our central units are connected to the Internet. So the, through an app, we can cut them on. So I can, usually can cut it on at 6 o'clock in the morning so to be at a decent temperature by the time that you get here i know it's not the temperature you want trust me i hear it all the time but if i went with the colds and, and against the hots or i went with the hots against the colds it'd be a civil war so but listen but we do we cut it on a couple of hours ahead of time hopefully to have it ready well the internet was down so that didn't work oh right, let's recap i'm gonna be honest with you People are dying. People are throwing up. The internet's not working. I can't cut the heat on at the church. I don't know why we're going to get all this sound going. So I come in this morning, and uh, me and Alicia, and, and she tried to stay home with that sick kid. I said, no, Mama, I need you. And, I, and so, sorry about that. And so then we, then we come in here, and Alicia's unlocking all the doors of the church. I'm back there trying to get everything going. I get to a certain point where I don't know how to you know, with the, some of the technical stuff for streaming the Facebook through our computer system, through the camera and all that. I've put the earbuds in. I've got my vomiting son in my ears telling me what to do to connect everything. Okay. And time is ticking. People are coming in for the eight o'clock service. The heat's still blowing. Oh, right. We're trying to get everything warmed up. And, to, and Scott come back there to talk to me. I said, not now, man. <laughs> not now, Scott. I got my sick kid in my ear. I got to get this figured out. So we finally, well, the internet wasn't, we had to restart the internet. The computer wasn't working. Da, da, da. The password got changed somehow. It was just crazy. Every step of the way that could be difficult was difficult and then we what time we start the first service 805 810 or something like that. we were late starting the first service and then we finally got started so we hit play here we go we're ready we hit play you know how we do the video announcements the volume isn't working because a button had gotten hit somewhere along the way that completely shifted all of our things so we finally had to figure that out restart the video again and finally here we go thomas leach saw me in the back hey how you doing i said i got it up to here thomas up to here buddy and he went straight in the prayer room didn't even look back i said amen pray for me brother pray for me i need it i need it so you fast forward to it so we have our time of worship right and then we come up here and i start to preaching and some people you know no matter what you do what you're preaching on their faces aren't pleasant it don't matter they won't even look at you half the time right they'll just What is going on up here? And I'm up here, in Genesis, in Genesis, ah, in the curse, in the law. And finally, one time during that sermon this morning, I said, look at me. And I said, why did you even come if you're not going to look at me? And I said, well, you didn't come to see me, did you? Amen. What I want to tell you is this morning at Grace Matches Church, I preached the 8 a.m. service full of more truth than grace. More truth than grace. Because I was all up in myself. Does that make sense? But by the time second service got around, we had Sunday, got to hang out with people, got the fellowship, got to spend a little prayer time, and got everything right. Now we're back balanced out. And so we come to the second service, we've got truth, but we've got grace. Amen? Matter of fact, I high, at the end of the first service, I high-fived Scott. I said, we made it. <laughs> we made it. The roof didn't fall in. It was just one of those days. And when you're full of yourself, and your own problems and your own worries that's when you end up being full of truth and not grace but when we're full of jesus we'll be full of grace and truth look at this next slide you know the the building blocks of dna for is the block of life dna is a it's a double helix and you notice those two sections that are going they're perfectly balanced it's the core of life and they wrap around each other they run in opposite directions and they correct each other simultaneously and they keep each other balanced 
and centered in the DNA. Grace and truth should be the DNA of the believer. It should be at the core of who we are. They're literally the building blocks of the Christian faith. Martin Luther once said this, the devil doesn't care which side of the horse we fall off of as long as we don't stay in the saddle. He doesn't care. I don't want to fall into the ditch of liberalism. I'm not. Okay? And I don't want to fall into the ditch of legalism. I don't want to do that either. We need to ride that horse with one foot in the stirrup of grace and one foot in the stirrup of truth. Many unbelievers only know two kinds of Christians, and too many unbelievers attend two kinds of churches, those who speak truth without grace and those who are all grace but never get around to the truth. And what I want people to see in me and in our church and in you and in us is someone who, in the spirit of grace, loves them enough to tell them the truth and to tell them for the right reasons, not to be superior, to let them have it but out of grace and love and mercy and compassion. And so here's the next step for you tonight, guys. If every one of us here in this room, we tend to tip the scale one way or another. Now, you may be a little bit, you know, you're more of a truther than a gracer, or you may be more of a gracer than you are a truther. But which way do you lean? Your answer reveals where you need to work in becoming more like Christ. It shows you something. Maybe you're a truther. And even though you were right, even though you took a stand on the right thing, uh, you may have won a battle, but you've lost a war with somebody. You may need to go back to somebody and offer grace, man, and grace and grace. On the other hand, maybe there's a relationship. Maybe there's somebody you've given them all grace and no truth. And what they need from you are some loving words of confrontation in the spirit of grace and counsel so they can go in a different direction. But if you want to know where to find the perfect balance of grace and truth, look at the cross. When you look at the cross, grace says, literally, no matter how sinful you are, you can be forgiven. And truth says, because of your sin, Christ was crucified. Grace and truth. I mean, think about it for just a moment. That moment you draw your last breath here on earth, and you open your eyes, and you're in the presence of God. And at that moment, you're going to see grace and truth personified. Because grace, because of grace, you're going to say, wow, I'm really here. I made it. And then you're going to see the nail-scarred hands of Jesus, and you're going to say, I'm here because of you. And that's the truth. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the grace and truth that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for the balance of the Christian life. Lord, help us to be more like you and just less like us in the flesh. Listen, guys, every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe tonight, again, you just need to ask God, God, am I leaning too far in one direction or another? Do I, give my, do I dole out grace to me, but only truth to others? Am I balanced? Am I showing grace in my relationships? Am I showing truth in my relationships? Do I love people enough to tell them the truth in grace? Do I love people enough that after I share the truth with them, the grace in me allows me to love them anyway? Grace and truth. Is that you? And maybe you're here tonight. Maybe you've never received the Holy Spirit the very one who allows us supernaturally to display this grace and truth in the life of others. Maybe tonight you need Jesus, man. Maybe that's why, uh, maybe that's why only quote-unquote truth comes out because you don't have the grace of God. And you need Jesus. Why don't you be sincere with God and maybe pray a prayer like this and say, Father God, I'm a sinner. Just tell him, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner. I sin. Lord, I, I see the faults in others, but I don't see them in myself, but I see them now. Forgive me. I turn from my sin, and I'm turning to Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Lord, in your death, burial, and resurrection, I'm trusting you, not me. Save me, Jesus. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, you were just radically saved by the power of God. I want to encourage you to make that decision public. 
maybe tonight you need to come like so many recently have been baptized and your baptism maybe is on the wrong side of your salvation or maybe you've never been baptized and you know that's what God is calling you to do why don't you come tonight and do that maybe God is calling you to be a part of the Grace Baptist family to plant your roots here to put on the jersey to be part of the team to serve here in grace and truth why don't you come tonight and do that but whatever it is whatever God is calling you to do during this invitation don't waste it father God we surrender this invitation to you I just pray that your people will use it for their good and for your glory we love you it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray amen will you stand with me in need of grace in need of Mercy raining down from high up.